We're going to learn about the concept of resonance using a water pitcher and some running water. The idea here is that as the water flows through into the pitcher, the level will rise and the frequency of the sound that you hear will change as a product of the resonance uh, of the pitcher. The idea here is that in the full length of the pitcher, you can fit a pretty long sine wave, but as the water level rises, the sine wave that can fit into the pitcher gets gradually smaller and smaller, meaning that the frequency should get higher. Let's test that by running the water through it and recording the sound. Let's take a look at the spectrum of the sound to see if it worked. Okay, here we are looking at the recording of the video I just made at the sink. And I'm going to zoom into this part right here, because this is actually the part that corresponds to the water flowing into the pitcher. The rest of it is just me talking. So let's zoom in. This looks like, you know, just a bunch of noise on the screen, but actually what we're seeing here on the dark parts of the graph are the frequencies that are showing up the most strongly in the recording. So as we scroll along in time, we can see that those frequencies are changing. And right at the end, this is what corresponds to that sound of the noise of the water going in the pitcher going up in frequency. Let's take a quick listen. So what's happening here is that as the water is flowing in, it's creating turbulence because it's not just sitting still at the bottom of the pitcher. It's jumping up and down. It's creating lots of bubbles. It's setting air into motion during the pour. So what's happening is that when it's not quite filled yet, there's a frequency here just under 500 hertz. That's the resonant frequency. That's the frequency that is most strongly supported by the length of the pitcher in between the surface of the water and the top. And then as the surface of the water rises and rises and rises, the length of the sine wave that can fit in between it and the top of the pitcher gets shorter and shorter. And so the frequency of that sine wave would get higher. Now, what we're hearing here aren't sine waves. Um, it's a much more complicated signal because it's, it's, a, it's a product of noise. Um, and few sounds in nature would ever be as clear and singular as, as a sine wave. So let's go back a little bit. We can even see these other frequencies going up. What I'm going to do is show you the spectrum of the sound. So first we're going to take a spectrum of this early part. Okay, I'm going to put that over to the left. And then I'm going to take a spectrum of this later part. Okay, I'm going to put that over to the right. Okay, so we have early spectrum on the left. I'm going to zoom into those lower frequency components. We can see some structure down there. Okay. And I'm going to compare these first three peaks in both of these spectra, okay? So the first peak here in the early part was 278 hertz, and later that same lowest peak was 311, so it went up a little bit. The second peak is around 1073 hertz, and that one also went up to just about 1400. The third peak was around 2000, and it went up to around 2360. So all three of these peaks are actually resonances that fit within the bottle. The rest of the spectrum is really more um, like the different kinds of noise that would be bopping around in there, but those first three resonances are quite important. So how does this relate to speech? Well, I told you a moment ago how the rest of this recording was just my voice. If we go and zoom into that, we can see that we can view the spectrum just going to change our settings just a little bit here. When we view the spectrum, typically for any person's voice, there are a number of different resonances. And usually we'll, in fact, see one, two, three resonances. One, two, three. So it might not look clear at first glance because we're just getting used to this, but this concept of resonance and how it changes as we change the dimensions of an object will help us understand how we analyze the acoustics of speech. Because if we just look at the waveform, we can't really get a sense of all the different frequencies that are in it. 
for that, we have to look at the spectrogram or the spectrum. To break down what we're looking at here, let's animate this with a little cartoon. We have the pitcher and it has a little bit of water in it. And the sine wave that would just fit into that pitcher has this length. And let's just say that the air particles are just being set into motion just for the fact that there's turbulence in the water. And that's a pretty important point here. The air particles have to be set into motion. You don't hear any sound if there's just standing water. So this would be a low frequency wave. Now as we pour more water into the pitcher, that first sine wave no longer fits in between the surface of the water and the top of the pitcher. Instead, there's a shorter sine wave. So now we're going to get a mid-frequency wave, or a mid-frequency sound. And as we continue pouring water into the pitcher, a shorter and shorter wavelength would fit in. And again, it's important to remember that the air particles are continually set into motion by the fact that the water continues to pour in. So we have a high frequency wave there. And what we're demonstrating with these sine waves is a concept called standing waves, which are just the sine waves that form to fit the length of a resonating chamber if its air particles are just simply set into motion. So what's interesting about sine waves that are standing waves is that you don't have to sing or hum or do anything at this exact frequency. This frequency will just simply form because it's the one that fits the resonating chamber.